So we get those questions, those questions like, what time is it? Why are there only seven recognized colors in the rainbow? It's summertime, Mom. Can I stay up late? Oh, just one more book, one more story. Or can we have another pajama day today? Or we've all heard it, right? Are we there yet? Our children, they're just full of questions. It's wonderful. It's part of who you are as a child. It makes you who you are. You have all those questions in you, and they're so great. And for us adults, getting the chance to answer one of those questions, it's a good thing. You know, because when a child comes to you, and they ask you something, anything, and it could be anyone. It could be your own child. It could be maybe a neighbor's kid or one of the children here in church, or maybe even your own younger sibling. When a child comes and asks you something, there's this underlying message they're giving. And they cannot articulate it yet. But there's this message of, I trust you. I value your opinion. Or even on the simplest level, with our little, little ones, I enjoy talking with you. I want to know more about what you're saying because I just want to be with you when they bring those questions. Like, for example, your parent, you're looking down at your child, and it's time. Get your shoes on. It's time to go. Why? You just need shoes on. Come on, let's go, let's go. It's time to go. Why? Just put your shoes on. We gotta be there right now. Why? I, Cause we gotta go, come on, let's just go. They're not asking you really to explain the universe. They're not asking you to explain really why. It's just a way that young children engage us and want to spend time with us. And it's a beautiful, wonderful thing. A time where they just want to know more. They ask all these questions. We ask all these questions. There's different kinds of questions that we ask. The simplest, the easiest ones of all are those factual questions. Those questions that there's a simple answer to. And even if you know, don't know it, you can easily look it up on Google or ask Siri or Alexa or whatever you have and go from there. Questions like, all right, you already got from Pastor Nathan this morning, who was Isaac's father? Who was Isaac's mother? Sarah. Sarah. Okay, Sunday school people, come on. <laughs> Sarah. Sarah, easy questions. And if you didn't know that this morning, it's something you could easily look up. There's a right answer to that. Then we have analytical questions. They're a little bit harder. They draw you in in a way of you have to build upon those factual questions. You have to analyze. And there are a set of right answers, but it's not just one. Questions like, from the readings this morning, how is it different how Abraham treated his child and how Jesus treated the children that the disciples were keeping them away? What was the difference? You have to think about those and analyze it a little bit more. And then we have open-ended questions. For those of you who have those great big imaginations, these are great questions for you. They're productive questions. There's questions where there is no right or wrong answer. It really depends on what you think. Questions like, I wonder, as Abraham is going up that mountain with his child, and child's carrying the wood, I wonder what he must have been feeling knowing he heard loud and clear a direct 
literal voice from the Lord telling him to do this. And also knowing how hard it's going to be to sacrifice his son. Wonder what he was feeling. What was he feeling? That's that open under question. But the hardest, I think, honestly, the hardest of all are questions where we need to make a claim. We need to stake a claim in our faith evaluative questions. Questions like, you think about all those disciples, who was most likely, this is where you're staking your claim, who was the most likely disciple, knowing what we know about them, to start keeping children from coming to Jesus? Questions like, if in that moment that Abraham was with Isaac, God could instantly send an angel into that moment and stop Abraham in his tracks and then also make a ram appear in the thicket out of nowhere. If God can do that, why doesn't God stop the bad guys all the time in their tracks? Why doesn't, well, why doesn't God make it something appear? Why doesn't he just make tornadoes disappear before they destroy something? They're hard questions. They're hard for us as adults. But they're important questions of faith. And so what do you do? A child asks you those kind of questions. What do you do in that moment? Well, we've got these two great examples from our Old Testament and our New Testament about how to respond and how not to respond. You know, those disciples, we give them such a hard time, don't we? But think about it. You're leaving church today. And Mike, can I use an example this morning? Mike is on his way out, but we have to tell our president something. We need to, and one of our little children or one of our children here in church comes up to us and asks us something. What do we do in that moment? When you're on your way to work, you know you're going to be running late, and your child asks you a question of faith. What do you do? What do you do in those moments? You know, lifting up that faith of that child, valuing that as the most important thing in that moment is something that's countercultural. It's something we have to teach ourselves, but it is so important to their faith. Even if it's something as simple as, you know, that's a really great question, but, you know, I, I have to go talk to him five minutes. Give me five minutes. You look at the clock, and I will be right back in five minutes to be there for you. And then commit to that and honor that commitment to that child. It's, it's honestly what I feel Jesus was doing when he's told the disciples, let the children come to me. It's honoring those children's questions letting them come to a safe person in faith. So what happens? They have that question. You're there in that moment with them. How do you respond? Well, we have Abraham's example today to look at. And if you are in your Bible right now, if not, it's really easy. Just open up your Bible. First, cha- first book of the Bible, Genesis, is right there, chapter 22. We're going to be looking at verse 7 and 8. So if you want to open that there while I continue to chat along up there, go ahead and do so. So when we get there, you'll be able to see what I'm talking about when we look at that. So Abraham, so Genesis 22, we're looking at 7 and 8. Abraham is with his son, and they're going up that mountain. And I can only imagine what he's feeling and that struggle he's having in his heart of faith, of what's going to happen. I want to obey you, Christ, or I want to obey you, God. It's my child. I love him. 
And he's in that struggle, in that hard faith crisis. And look at verse 7 with me. Isaac, Isaac asks him, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? It's like saying, Dad, I don't get it. What's going on? This is not making sense. And here's Abraham's answer. I want you to look at it. because Sometimes it's helpful to read it too and not just hear it. Look at his answer in verse 8. God himself will provide the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. He didn't dismiss the question. Even in his own struggle of stuff going on, he stopped. And he acknowledged his son. And he even answered his son the best way he possibly could. Because he didn't know. He said basically there, I don't know. God will provide. That's a legitimate answer. I don't know. But he went beyond that. God will provide. He made a statement of faith there. And in doing so, he modeled his faith for this child. And saying God will provide, it's saying God only knows. As Pastor Nathan said in our children's time, trust. Trust in God. Trust in God. For God only knows. And then look at that sentence. It's a sentence. It's not a paragraph. It's not what I'm doing up here and you're all going, yes, Pastor Cassie, you're going on and on and on and on and on. It's simple. It's short. It's something that a child could actually absorb in that time. And here in this trial of faith, how does Abraham give us an example He responds to Isaac's question by acknowledging, sharing his faith in God when he really didn't know how God was going to handle the situation. And he kept his response simple. What a great example for us when our little ones bless us with their inquiries. And it is such a blessing to be yet to be able to get that chance to have that moment in helping a child with their faith. How do you do that? How do you get to that moment? Well, here is my shameless plug for VBS and Sunday school teachers. What a great opportunity to get that moment to help a child grow in their faith. And honestly, we get to grow too by being in those moments. And you're never too old. Think about Abraham. You're never too old. And that call that Jesus gave in Matthew 28 to go out and make disciples, that wasn't just go out, Pastor Nathan and Pastor Cassie. That's a call each and every one of us who calls ourselves Christian, that's a call we have. And what an easy opportunity to help with a child, helping them to become a disciple of Christ. You know, I hope this year, I'm so looking forward to this year, and I hope we have so many of those moments where our kids, our children, grow by asking their questions, and we also grow by being blessed to get the chance to attempt to answer them. Amen.